Our next speaker is Deborah Van Egeren, who worked with Dr. Amit Singh and Professor Mansur Amiji at Northeastern University. She will be speaking on synthesis, characterization, and SIRS functionalization of hollow gold nanoparticles. All right, so why study gold nanoparticles? Well, gold nanoparticles have several unique and useful physical and optical properties. First and foremost, they absorb light in the visible wavelengths, so they are colored. They also are obviously very small. This means they can pass in and out of cells quite easily. Also important for their many biological applications, they are relatively non-toxic, so you can put them in cells and they won't kill very many of them. There are several biological applications that are already being studied, including targeted drug delivery systems, photothermal cancer, cancer ablation, and bioimaging with these gold nanoparticles. Naturally, different sizes and shapes of gold nanoparticles are more well suited to different tasks. For example, you wouldn't want to try and coat a glass surface with some gold nanospheres. Maybe you'd rather use gold nanotriangles, nanoplates instead. Many studies focus on hollow gold nanospheres because of their increased surface area. This makes it easier to put a larger number of molecules on the gold surface. And these hollow gold nanospheres can be easily tuned to absorb light at different wavelengths, including the red, uh, wavelengths in the red or near IR regions. We synthesize gold nanoparticles with a galvanic replacement reaction or a transmetallation reaction. First, we started with solid silver nanospheres, and then we added a solution of chlororic acid to the silver nanospheres. Chlororic acid donates gold three cations to the solution, and these gold three cations are reduced by the silver nanospheres, giving a shell of elemental gold, while the silver is in turn oxidized and dissolves away into solution. So you get these nice hollow gold nanostructures that are porous. So we ran this reaction and we took samples during, at various time points during the reaction to follow the reaction progress and to see what exactly what was going on. The first way we characterized these samples taken at different times was through UV visible and NIR spectroscopy. There's a couple important things to notice about these spectra. First, you can see many of the samples have a peak at around 400 nanometers. This peak is characteristic of gold, gold nanoparticles, many gold, uh, not gold, but silver. This peak is characteristic of silver nanoparticles. And you can see that at some later time points, you get some absorption at 800 to 900 nanometers. Uh, this is characteristic of the hollow gold nanoparticles. So it looks like some hollow gold nanoparticles are forming, but it's difficult to compare between the peaks in these spectra because the samples were not diluted consistently. It may be useful to compare within the spectra different peaks to see better what's going on. So what we did was we took the absorbance at 800 nanometers at, for each sample and we divided it by the absorbance at 407, the silver peak for each sample to get a kind of a relative gold to silver ratio. And the results are shown here. You can see as the reaction progresses to seven hours when we stop the reaction, the um, gold to silver ratio increases. We also took images with a transmission electron mic microscope at various times during this reaction. Here we can see the one hour, t one hour image, one hour after the reaction has begun. Some of the, gold nano some of the silver nanoparticles are starting to show dots. These are sites of gold, nanoparticle, uh, gold deposition on the nanoparticles. These dots grow and become more prevalent as the reaction progresses. Eventually, at seven hours, you can see the formation of these hollow gold nanostructures. This, uh, these are exactly what we want, these hollow gold structures. They're porous, and we've synthesized them. Now, what, do, what are we going to do with them? Because we have a bunch of these lying around, we want to make them useful, right? So we're going to see if we can track their location inside cells using something called surface-enhanced Riemann spectroscopy, or SIRS. 
SIRS is a spectroscopy technique that is based on traditional Raman spectroscopy. Traditional Raman spectroscopy is a type of vibrational spectroscopy that measures the amount of Raman scattered light coming off of a sample. When you shine a light on a thin sample, most of the light passes through. A small percentage of that light, neglecting absorption, a small percentage of that light will be scattered by the sample, and a small percentage of the scattered light will be scattered inelastically, which means that the wavelength of the scattered light will be different than the wavelength of the incident light. The amount of scattered light that comes off of sample and the wavelengths at which the light is scattered depends on the molecules that are in the sample and the functional groups within the molecule. For example, if a molecule has a nitrile group, it will show a peak on the Raman spectrum at about 22 to 2300 reciprocal centimeters. Unfortunately, the intensity of Raman scattered light is very, very low. It's hard to detect in most samples. Surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy uses gold or silver nanoparticles to increase the intensity of the Raman scattered light coming from molecules that are very close to the nanoparticle surface. So what we did is we added this dye, 5 mercaptopentane nitrile, to the surface of the nanoparticles. This dye will give a peak at about 22 to 2300 reciprocal centimeters. This is in a region of the Vermont spectrum that, is not, that does not usually have peaks in biological system because, of course, you don't have much nitrile groups inside cells. And so by tracking the location uh, of the nitrile groups that show up in a sample, we can track the location of the nanoparticles and see where they go inside cells. So first, we synthesized a batch of these, uh, these dye-functionalized molecules, and we imaged them with, uh, we just imaged them without cells. We took the Raman spectrum of them outside of cells. You can see they show a nice peak at around 2255 nano, uh, uh, reciprocal centimeters. So it looks like we've definitely conjugated the dye to the nanoparticle surface. Now, when we put them inside cells, our results were a little more disappointing. So this image on the left here is the Raman image of a cell. And the brighter areas show where the CH stretching intensity is highest. The CH, CH bonds are present in most organic molecules. So this should be pretty representative of the distribution of organic molecules in this sample. You can see clearly the outline of a cell. And you can see uh, the nucleus, which is very bright, because it has very densely packed DNA inside it. Um, but when you try and look for the nitrile stretching peak in the same set of spectral data, you kind of get noise. Um, you, it's unlikely that the um, nanoparticles would have been evenly distributed like it seems in this sample. Well, evenly if there was a lot of nanoparticles in the sample, they would probably not be as evenly distributed as you see. Because first, the excess nanoparticle solution was aspirated before imaging. So you probably should see an outline of the cell, because all nanoparticles outside of the cell were removed. Also, it's unlikely you would see anything in the nucleus. You'd see a dark nucleus, because nanoparticles are, have been shown not to go inside the nucleus of the cell. So this is, uh, this may indicate that we did not use enough nanoparticles for imaging, beca because clearly not enough nanoparticles were taken into the cell. Or there could be an issue with nanoparticle uptake inside the cell. These are, uh, these are things that need to be investigated further. Work is continuing in the Amigi lab to see if they can adjust the nanoparticle concentration and incubation time to actually get a nice image of the cell with SIRS. And I would like to acknowledge my mentors, everybody at RSI, my sponsors, and of course CE, RSI, and MIT.
any questions? Uh, Professor Hunt. In the, the images that you showed of the nanoparticles, why do they seem kind of non perfect uh, spheres and different <coughs> from one another? And if you can you push any one of them, they don't ever feel like a perfect sphere. Okay, the question was the nanoparticles in this image are not perfect spheres. Um, why is that? Well, first, the hollow nanoparticles would not normally look like spheres because there need to be pores where the silver ions can uh, dif diffuse out of the structure. And as for the silver ones, there are defects in the crystallization of the silver during the uh, reduction process. So the silver should look more like spheres, but not exactly like spheres. And if in different points in the transmetallation reaction, the shape of the nanoparticle can slightly change because of the gold deposition in any silver dissolution. So that may also contribute to the anisotropy. Dr. Beganoff? Show the last image. The very last image? Yes. Okay. Okay. Can you tell me what the Rubin square value is, say, in the upper right corner of the left image? in general in that area? What's, what's the average sort of noise fluctuation in the image? Unfortunately, this data was, t oh, I should repeat the question. He asked what the fluctuation in the, um, in the, stretch, in the nitrile stretching peak was in this image here, right? Oh, this image, okay. In the upper part of what you would consider background, the dark region. Oh, this guy? Yes. That okay. One. Well. Um, I got this set of spectral data about on Tuesday. <laughs> um, so I wasn't given the actual spectra. I was only given these images because we had to send these out to a different department for imaging. So I, can't, I couldn't do analysis of that, but that would definitely be something to look at, especially I want to look at the absolute spectra of right, uh, these so samples. So. so now, if you had it, explain to me how you would compare these two to try and understand what's going on in the rest. To try and understand what's going on the right? Okay, first thing I would do is look at the absolute um, uh, intensity of the nitrile stretching peak in the spectra to see if the distribution, if the, if the, um, if it was, it, there actually was a nitrile stretching peak, which it would indicate that some nanoparticles are present, or if there wasn't one, to s and look at it that way first, and then Um, that's what I would do first. I don't know what, it, it would really depend on what would happen after that because if the intensity of the peak was very low, I would expect that there would be no nanoparticles in the cell. But if the intensity of the nanoparticles was very, uh, the nitrile stretching peak was high uniformly, I would have to go back and look at the um, actual aspiration process that, uh, that took out the excess nanoparticles and maybe do some transmission electron microscopy to look at why the, um, this, the um, nanoparticles were localizing in the nucleus because that doesn't make any sense. Time for one more question, Professor Holt. Was there an intermediate step performed where you check the success of the nitrile functionalization? Um, this was supposed to be the intermediate step. Uh, the um, Raman spectrum of the nanoparticles that uh, didn't go into cells. Um, you can see that they do have a nitrile stretching peak. This is probably not due to any free nitrile groups because they were the nanoparticles were purified before um, before imaging. So it's likely that they were on the, that you would see a peak with the nanoparticles. Let's thank Deborah.